Without further ado, please join me in welcoming our guest for tonight, <laughs> Professor Noam Chomsky. very much. Uh, first question always is, can you hear me? Uh, yes, okay. Uh, rare response, it's usually no. Uh, uh, perhaps it's a sign of my age, uh, perhaps something else, uh, but uh, uh, I can't help thinking more and more of the world that we are bequeathing to our children and grandchildren. And it's not a pretty picture, uh, not one that should inspire pride. Uh, there are several grim shadows that uh, hover menacingly uh, over thoughts about our legacy. Uh, two are dominant because they literally uh, reach as far as uh, species survival, at least survival in any decent form. Uh, those are nuclear war and uh, environmental disaster. Uh, not only is nothing serious being done about them, but actually current decisions are uh, increasing the threats. Uh, just to give one of innumerable examples, uh, a couple of weeks ago a high-level uh, international scientific study was released that estimated that uh, uh, within the next 20 years, 100 million people will die from the effects of climate change, uh, mostly in the poor countries. In the U.S., uh, uh, there was scarcely a mention, uh, not one in the mainstream media. Uh, the, uh, in fact, the reactions are uh, uh, illustrated by a recent report on uh, the acceleration of Arctic, uh, war, um, Arctic ice melting. Uh, the reaction is uh, to plan to exploit the newly exposed resources to increase the uh, use of uh, fossil fuels, uh, that is to accelerate the catastrophe. Uh, uh, reactions such as these, and it's easy to go on, uh, demonstrate an extraordinary willingness to uh, sacrifice the lives of our children and our grandchildren uh, for short-term gain, or perhaps uh, an equally uh, remarkable willingness to shut our eyes uh, so as not to see impending peril uh, the way an infant sometimes does. Uh, as for the threat of nuclear war, it's on the front pages daily, uh, but in a way that would seem outlandish to an independent observer uh, viewing the strange doings on Earth. Uh, the major current threat, not for the first time, is in the Middle East. The general picture in the West, uh, clear and straightforward, it's far too dangerous to allow Iran to reach nuclear capability. That is the capability enjoyed by numerous powers uh, to produce nuclear weapons uh, if they decide to do so. Uh, as to whether they've decided to do so, uh, U.S. intelligence, the most knowledgeable source, uh, tells us that it, it doesn't know. The International Atomic Energy Agency had a recent visit, re recent report a few weeks ago, and it concludes, and I'll quote it, it cannot demonstrate the absence of undeclared nuclear material and activities in Iran. Uh, that's true. It's a condition that can't possibly be satisfied conveniently. So therefore, Iran must be denied the right to enrich uranium that's guaranteed by the Non-Proliferation Treaty, of which, of course, it's a signer. Well, that's the general picture in the West, I stress in the West, uh, not in the world. 
Uh, we saw that recently in the meetings of the uh, non-aligned movement in Tehran. That's most of the world, in fact, though they're not called part of the international community. It's a technical term of political science that refers to the United States and whoever happens to be going along with it. The, uh, uh, the non-aligned movement, uh, once again, as before, they vigorously reaffirmed Iran's right to enrich uranium as a member of the NPT uh, and uh, condemned the sanctions and so on. Uh, uh, the, uh, the interesting reactions in the Arab world that I'll return to. Uh, the uh, basic concern, uh, the, the basic reason for concern has been stated succinctly by General Lee Butler. He's the former head of the U.S. Strategic Command, the military institution that's responsible for nuclear weapons, uh, nuclear weapons planning, and so on. Uh, he writes that it is dangerous in the extreme that in the cauldron of animosities that we call the Middle East, one nation should arm itself with nuclear weapons, which may inspire other nations to do so. Uh, General Butler, however, is not referring to Iran, uh, but as you may have guessed, he's referring to Israel. Uh, that's the country that uh, ranks highest in European polls as the most dangerous country in the world, right above Iran. The Arab world is different there. Also, Israel ranks highest as the most dangerous country, and the United States is right behind it as the second most dangerous. Uh, Iran, according to Western polls, is generally disliked, but not considered much of a threat. Uh, among the populations, that is, and not the dictatorships. The Western media and commentary keep almost entirely to the views of the dictators, and so we hear regularly that uh, the Arabs want decisive action against Iran. Uh, the populations don't, but it's only the dictators who count according to Western conceptions of democracy. Actually, that reflects the uh, one of many examples reflecting the deep contempt uh, for democracy and fear of democracy in elite Western opinion. It's a matter highly relevant to the Arab Spring. I'll return to that. Well, unlike Iran, uh, Israel refuses to allow inspections or to join the Non-Proliferation Treaty, has hundreds of nuclear weapons, uh, advanced delivery systems, also a long record of violence and repression, which uh, I presume it's unnecessary to review. Uh, meanwhile, um, severe threats of attack con continue from the United States and particularly Israel. Uh, uh, maybe some of you have uh, antiquarian interests. Uh, if there are any, you may remember a document called the United Nations Charter, which is theoretically the foundation of modern international law. Uh, it has an explicit provision banning the threat or use of force in international affairs. Uh, every time a U.S. president uh, opens his mouth on this topic or someone writes an article, they're violating the U.N. Charter if anybody cares. Uh, uh, there happen to be two rogue states which disregard international law and are powerful enough to get away with it. The United States, of course, and Israel as long as it's protected by the United States or anyone else who's protected by the world superpower. Actually, the European Union goes along with this. Well, the threats are not just words. Now, there is an ongoing war. Uh, includes assassinations, what we'd call international terrorism, if anyone else was doing it, uh, economic warfare, which uh, uh, is a form of war. Uh, U.S. threats have cut Iran out of the international financial system. Uh, other countries are afraid to stand up to the dangerous uh, bully who runs things. Uh, five former NATO 
commanders uh, recently released a new grand strategy, which they called it, which identified weapons of finance uh, as acts of war that justify military response when directed against us, that is, uh, cutting Iran out of global financial markets uh, is a different matter. Uh, the U.S. is openly engaged, in fact, uh, with much uh, self-praise in cyber war, large-scale cyber war against Iran. Uh, the U.S. Pentagon uh, identifies cyber war as a form of military aggression, which justifies a military response, uh, but again, against us. Uh, uh, Israel's lethal armory includes advanced <coughs> Submarines just provided by Germany, new ones in recent months, which are capable of carrying Iran, uh, Israel's uh, nuclear-tipped missiles. Uh, these are sure to be deployed in the Gulf, or nearby may already be, uh, if Israel proceeds with its uh, threats to bomb Iran, or more likely to try to set up conditions in which the United States will do so. And the United States, of course, has a vast array of nuclear weapons throughout the region as throughout the world. Uh, for the region, it ranges from uh, uh, the Indian Ocean uh, to the Mediterranean, including enough firepower in the Gulf to destroy most of the world. Uh, another story in the news right now is uh, the Israeli bombing of uh, the Osirak reactor in uh, Iraq in 1981. Uh, that's now presented as a model for um, Israeli bombing of Iran. It's rarely mentioned that the bombing of the Osirak reactor did not end Iraq's nuclear weapons program. It initiated it. That reactor was not capable of producing nuclear materials. Uh, but as soon as uh, it was bombed, uh, Saddam Hussein uh, initiated a program of uh, nuclear weapons development, which got pretty far. Uh, I might add that uh, the United States helped with that. Uh, in 1989, uh, after the Iran-Iraq war was over, the first President Bush, uh, the good one, uh, and, and, um, uh, invited uh, Iraqi nuclear engineers to the United States uh, for advanced training in nuclear weapons production. Well, that's not mentioned either. Uh, <clears throat> uh, if indeed uh, there is a bombing of the Iranian nuclear facilities, uh, one of the consequences among a lot of other horrible ones that one can think of, is that they're very likely to react exactly the way Saddam Hussein did. <coughs> Too much talking in the last week. Uh, right now, uh, we should be thinking about the 50th anniversary of what has been called the most dangerous moment in human history. Uh, those are the words of... Uh, historian and Kennedy advisor Arthur Schlesinger. He's referring to the uh, October 1962 uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, the most, the specific day that was the most dangerous moment happened to be October 27th. We're coming close to the exact 50th anniversary. Uh, at that point, uh, Kennedy had raised the nuclear alert to the most to the highest level, short of actual launch. launch. Uh, he had authorized uh, NATO aircraft, uh, mostly US, but others too, Turkish pilots and so on. Uh, they were authorized to fly to Moscow uh, and bomb, uh, setting off a likely nuclear conflagration. Uh, the regulations were so lax that individual pilots uh, could have made that decision uh, on their own in the huge uh, bomber fleet that uh, was in the air, U.S. bomber fleet, about a third of the total B-52 fleet flying right around Russia, 
with individual jet pilots carrying uh, 15 uh, bombs, each of them Hiroshima-level nuclear bombs, and with authorization to launch them if they felt like doing it. Uh, at the uh, peak of the crisis, October 27th, uh, Kennedy estimated the probability of nuclear war at perhaps 50%. It's a war that would have destroyed the northern hemisphere, uh, President Eisenhower had warned. Uh, risking, uh, racing, facing the risk of uh, destruction, if not suicide, uh, Kennedy refused to agree publicly to an offer by Russian Premier Khrushchev to end the crisis by simultaneous withdrawal of uh, Russian missiles from Cuba and U.S. missiles from Turkey on Russia's border. Now, these incidentally were obsolete missiles which were already being replaced by invulnerable Polaris uh, submarines in the Mediterranean, uh, but Kennedy refused. It was felt necessary to establish the principle that uh, the United, that Russia has no right to have any offensive weapons anywhere outside its territory, uh, while the United States must have the unilateral right uh, to have them all over the world, uh, on the borders of Russia, targeting Russia or China or any other uh, enemy, perceived enemy. In fact, just a few months before the Cuban Missile Crisis broke out, uh, the United States had secretly deployed uh, nuclear missiles in Okinawa, uh, aimed at China uh, at a moment of elevated regional tensions there. Well, fortunately, Khrushchev backed down, or we wouldn't be having this meeting today. Uh, but the world can't be assured of such sanity forever. Uh, particularly threatening is the fact that intellectual opinion and even scholarship uh, hail Kennedy's achievement as his finest hour and a model of uh, crisis management and uh, how to proceed with a similar crises in the future. Uh, ten years later, during the 1973 Israel-Arab War, uh, Henry Kissinger called a high-level nuclear alert uh, to warn the Russians not to interfere uh, while he was secretly informing Israel that they could violate the ceasefire that the United States and Israel had imposed. We just learned about that. Uh, when Ronald Reagan came into office uh, a few years later. Uh, the United States launched operations probing Russian defenses and simulating air and naval attacks on Russia, uh, while at the same time placing Pershing missiles in Germany that had a five-minute flight time to Moscow. Uh, they provided what the CIA called a super-sudden first-strike capability. Well, the Russians were deeply concerned, not surprisingly. They thought these things might be an attack. And that actually led to a major war scare in 1983, which, again, could have wiped us all out. Uh, there have been hundreds of cases of uh, w when human intervention aborted a first strike uh, minutes before launch, the automated response systems give uh, a warning of a, an attack, and there's a few minutes for uh, uh, direct human intervention. We know of hundreds of such cases uh, in the United States. Uh, we don't have Russian records, but it's almost certain that uh, their systems are far more accident-prone, so we have no idea how many times this has happened with their systems. In fact, it's a near miracle that nuclear war has so far been averted. Uh, meanwhile, India and Pakistan have come close to nuclear war several times. The crises, crises that sparked this remain. Uh, both India and Pakistan have refused to sign the Non-Proliferation Treaty uh, along with Israel and have received uh, U.S. support uh, 
for the development of their nuclear weapons programs. That's until today, in the case of India, which has now become a U.S. ally, uh, war threats in the Middle East, uh, which might become reality very soon, uh, once again uh, escalate the dangers. Well, within the Middle East, there's a very straightforward way to mitigate or perhaps end uh, whatever threat Iran is alleged to pose. Uh, that is to establish a nuclear weapons-free zone in the Middle East. And that opportunity, uh, which has been alive for a long time, is coming again in just a few months. There's to be an international conference uh, in Finland uh, on moving ahead with this plan. It has overwhelming international support, including, incidentally, uh, a majority of public opinion uh, in Israel. Uh, it's been forcefully advanced by Egypt since 1995. Uh, so far, it's been blocked by the United States, uh, which insists that uh, Israel be excluded, uh, most recently by President Obama, who added that condition to any such move. Uh, uh, unless there's large-scale public pressure in the United States, uh, uh, it's very unlikely that anything will be done. And there can't be large-scale public pressure for the simple reason that almost no one even knows about it. Uh, the media don't mention it, period. You can read about it in specialized uh, arms control journals. There's dissident writers. I write about it, a couple of others. Uh, but it doesn't reach uh, the public, so there can't be any protest. Uh, that's a, an important illustration of a much more general point uh, the limits of freedom in practice in societies in which popular struggle over a long period has reached a high level of freedom in principle, uh, more so in the United States than anywhere else, which I presume is one of the reasons why the techniques of suppression are more sophisticated. There's more freedom, can't take chances. Well, let's... Uh, put these uh, grim prospects aside and turn to how the current world system developed since World War II, the modern period, how it's changed over the years and where things stand today and then where the Arab Spring fits into this. Now, there is a common theme in the foreign policy and political science literature, actually I'll quote from the U.S. Academy of Political Science, recent issue, the theme that uh, only a few years ago, America was hailed to stride the world as a colossus with unparalleled power and unmatched appeal, but it is now in decline, uh, ominously facing the prospects of its final decay. Uh, there's a recent issue of the major establishment journal of international relations and foreign affairs, which has on the front cover, big black letters, uh, the title of the issue. The title is, Is America Over? Uh, the themes are widely believed and with some reason, uh, though uh, a number of qualifications, crucial qualifications, uh, are in order. Uh, the decline is real, but it's not recent. It's been going on since World War II. At the end of World War II, the United States reached the height of its power, actually a level of power with, without any precedent in world history. Uh, uh, the United States uh, had, uh, uh, well, I'll come back to it. There's a commonly drawn corollary to the American decline that uh, uh, powers shifting to China and India, now, that's highly dubious. Uh, the, these are poor countries, uh, severe internal problems. Uh, the world is certainly becoming more diverse, but despite America's decline, uh, it, which is real, in the, in the foreseeable future, there's no competitor for global hegemonic power. It'll stay that way for quite some time to come. Uh, just to keep the one dimension alone and not the only one, uh, military power, 
uh, US, uh, the US military spending is approximately equal to the rest of the world combined. Uh, technologically, the US military is far more advanced. Uh, the United States is alone in saturating the world with military bases, maybe a thousand of them. Uh, another indication is the recently announced uh, figures on global arms sales. Uh, the US holds more than three quarters of the global market. Uh, sales are more than 10 times as high as the second place country, Russia, and military dimension is only one of many. Well, going back to the beginning of the contemporary era, peak of US power, uh, during World War II, uh, uh, the, 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 the war itself uh, greatly strengthened the United States uh, economically and militarily. Uh, the government stimulus ended the depression, uh, industrial production quadrupled practically, uh, other industrial powers were severely damaged or destroyed uh, even before of the war. In fact, 50 years before, the United States had been by far uh, the richest power in the world, but not a major player in world affairs. Uh, it was understood by Washington planners, uh, President Roosevelt's planners, during the war, that the United States would emerge in a position of overwhelming power. Uh, it's quite clear from the documentary record that, uh, quote, President Roosevelt was aiming at United States hegemony in the post-war world. That's the accurate conclusion of uh, leading British diplomatic historian Jeffrey Warner, one of the leading specialists on this topic. And plans were developed to control uh, most of the world, to control what was called a grand area. The grand area would include, as a minimum, Western Hemisphere, it's taken for granted, uh, all of the Far East, the former British Empire, uh, which of course includes the crucial Middle East oil reserves, uh, and also as much of Eurasia as possible, uh, of course, crucially its most advanced uh, industrial commercial regions in Western Europe. And within these expansive domains, to quote the documents, the United States was to maintain unquestioned power uh, with military and economic supremacy uh, while ensuring the limitation of any exercise of sovereignty by states that might interfere with its global designs. Uh, those doctrines incidentally still prevail uh, but the capacity to implement them has reduced. And the plans were not unrealistic for the reasons I mentioned. Uh, the United States had about half the, the world's total wealth, unmatched security. Uh, the ensuing Cold War uh, consisted overwhelmingly of efforts by the two superpowers to enforce order in their own domains. For Russia, that meant Eastern Europe, the traditional invasion corridor. Uh, for the United States, it meant most of the rest of the world. Well, that was 1945 and the ensuing Cold War. <coughs> uh, very quickly, the grand area began to erode. The first blow, and a very serious one, was in 1949. Uh, that's called the loss of China. China became independent, pulled out of the grand area. Uh, that had severe domestic reper repercussions internally to the United States. Uh, numerous accusations about blame for the loss of China. That continues until today. Actually, the phrase itself is kind of interesting, the loss of China. You can only lose something that you possess, right? Like, I can't lose your computer. I can lose my computer. Uh, but it's just taken for granted that the United States owns the world. So if China 
moved to independence. We lost China. And then comes the question, who's to blame for that loss? Well, shortly after, it seemed that uh, we might also lose Southeast Asia. Uh, that led to Washington's uh, horrendous Indochina wars and also the huge massacres in Indonesia in 1965 as U.S. dominance was restored. Uh, meanwhile, subversion and massive violence continued elsewhere in the effort to retain what's called stability, which another technical term, which means conformity to U.S. demands. Despite this, decline was inevitable. Uh, as the industrial world reconstructed after the war and decolonization pursued its agonizing course. Uh, by 1970, the U.S. share of world wealth had declined to about 25 percent, still colossal, but not 50 percent. It remains at a, roughly that level. Uh, the industrial world by then had become uh, what's called tripolar, three major uh, centers. Uh, one U.S.-based North America, the other German-based Europe, and the third Asia, then Japan-based, uh, already by 1970 becoming the most uh, dynamic uh, growth region in the industrial world. Uh, Twenty years after that, the Soviet Union collapsed. And for those who want to understand the reality of the Cold War, it's highly informative to look closely at what happened when it ended. It tells us quite a lot about what it was about. At that time, the first Bush administration was in office. It immediately declared officially that uh, policies would remain pretty much unchanged, but with different pretexts. So the large, huge, in fact, military establishment would be retained, but not for defense against the Russians, they were gone, uh, rather to confront what they called the technological sophistication of third world powers. Now, if you're a well-educated intellectual, you don't laugh when you hear that and nobody laughed. Uh, the, uh, it was also necessary to maintain what they called the defense industrial base. And that's a euphemism that refers to high-tech industry, which is heavily dependent on state subsidy, largely through the Pentagon funnel. Easy way to do it. Uh, the most interesting case was the intervention forces uh, which were established by President Carter, uh, aimed at the Middle East. Uh, there, the new plans stated, I'm quoting them, uh, our serious problems could not be laid at the Kremlin's door. The reason for the intervention forces had never been the Russians. That's contrary to 50 years of deceit, uh, but clouds had lifted can't appeal to that anymore. Uh, with the Russians gone, it was conceded that the threat had always been what's called radical nationalism, that is attempts by countries to pursue an independent course uh, in violation of grand area principles. Uh, actually, that lesson generalizes worldwide, as easily demonstrated. Uh, one very instructive case is NATO. As you know, NATO was established in order to defend Western Europe against the rampaging Russian hordes. Okay, 1989, no more Russian hordes. So if you believe received doctrine, uh, NATO should have been reduced or eliminated. That's not what happened. NATO expanded. It expanded to the east in violation of explicit promises to uh, Russian Premier Gorbachev. Gorbachev agreed uh, to uh, allow a uh, unified Germany uh, as part of a Western military system that's 
quite an astonishing concession if you think about the history of the century. That Germany alone had practically destroyed Russia several times in the century. Now he was agreeing to a unified, remilitarized Germany and inside a bigger military alliance. But he uh, insisted on a quid pro quo. Uh, he insisted on a guarantee that NATO would not expand to the east. He was particularly concerned with East Germany. Nobody dreamed of an expansion beyond. Uh, and he got the promise. The promise was that NATO would not expand one inch to the east. That was the phrase. Immediately, NATO expanded to East Germany. Uh, Gorbachev was kind of outraged, and, but when he protested, uh, President Bush and James Baker, Secretary of State, uh, pointed out to him that it was just a gentleman's agreement. Uh, they had never put it down in writing. And if he was naive enough to believe a gentleman's agreement, you know, his problem. Uh, so NATO is, the internal records have all been released on this. They're quite interesting to read. Uh, so NATO expanded to East Germany, then Clinton expanded it farther to the east. Uh, by now, uh, NATO has become a global intervention force under U.S. command, uh, which has an official mission. Uh, the official mission is to control uh, the international energy system, I mean sea lanes and pipelines anywhere, and in fact to do whatever the hegemonic power determines. Well, I'll leave the rest to you, but if you think it through, all of these things tell us quite a lot about the reality of the Cold War. Uh, I presume that's the reason why they're almost totally ignored in scholarship, which you can check pretty, pretty easily if you like. Uh, but the data, the documents are there, they're very clear and explicit, and I don't think I have to spell out what they mean. Well, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, there was a period of euphoria uh, with excited tales about uh, the end of history, uh, uh, awed acclaim for Clinton's foreign policy, which had entered a noble phase with a saintly glow, uh, as for the first time in history, a nation is guided by altruism alone, uh, dedicated to principles and values, uh, and nothing now stood in the way of the idealistic new world bent on ending inhumanity could at last carry forward unhindered uh, the emerging norm of humanitarian intervention. And those are quotes. Those, that's a small sample from uh, the inspired rhetoric of the most prominent intellectuals in the United States and Europe. Well, not everyone was so enraptured. Uh, the traditional victims, the Global South, had quite a different view. Uh, they bitterly condemned what they called the so-called right of humanitarian intervention, uh, recognizing it as just the old right of uh, imperial domination. Uh, but their voices are easily ignored, in fact, not mentioned. Uh, they are uh, what are called, what George Orwell called unpeople, not people, so we don't have to listen to them. Uh, after Bush II took over, second Bush, uh, it became increasingly, uh, it became pretty difficult to uh, ignore hostile world opinion uh, in the Arab world, particularly uh, Bush's approval ratings plummeted. And uh, one of Obama's most impressive feats is that he's been able to sink even lower than Bush, which is quite a trick. Got to give him credit for that. Uh, well, meanwhile, the decline continued. Uh, in the past decade, something extremely important happened. Uh, South America has been lost. That's serious. Uh, that has been that's after 500 years of imperial domination. And what happened is it pulled itself out. Uh, steps towards integration, towards independence, uh, kicking out all US military bases. Not trivial. That was always considered the safe, secure backyard that we didn't have to worry about. Well, that was 
serious enough, but far more serious would be moves towards independence in the Middle East. Uh, planners in the 1940s recognized that control of the incomparable energy resources of the Middle East would yield substantial control of the world, words of an influential Roosevelt advisor. And correspondingly, a loss of control uh, would threaten the global dominance that was clearly articulated during World War II and has been sustained since that day in the face of major changes in world order. Now the important word there is control. It's often misunderstood. That's what has dominated the U.S. policy towards the oil producing regions. Control, not access. If the U.S. was on 100% solar power, it would have the same policies towards the Middle East. In fact, in the 1950s and 60s, it wasn't relying at all on Middle East oil, but uh, had the same policies. Even more striking, in 1958, uh, the U.S. government decided to exhaust domestic supplies uh, instead of using cheap Saudi oil in order to benefit Texas oil producers to enrich them. So the U.S. used domestic resources, leaving big holes in the ground, which are, are now called the strategic reserve, uh, filled from oil overseas. That went on till the Nixon years. Uh, it's not access. It's control that matters. Uh, there's one illustration of that, which is of great contemporary uh, import. It's, like it's revealed in an important recent study just coming out uh, of the uh, 1953 U.S.-U.K. coup that uh, overthrew the parliamentary regime in, in Iran, uh, consequences that reverberate right to the present, very obviously. Now, this study is by a very fine Iran scholar, Ervan Abrahamian, very much worth reading. Uh, he shows very convincingly that standard accounts of the coup just can't be sustained. Uh, the primary causes were not Cold War concerns, contrary to claims. Uh, they weren't Iranian uh, irrationality that undermined Washington's benign intentions. And rather strikingly, the concerns were not access to Iran's oil, uh, rather uh, control over the oil, what the official documents call overall controls. That's what had to be maintained, which has broader implications for global dominance, which is threatened by independent nationalism. That's always been the primary concern, still is. Uh, a further danger in the Middle East is that it might move towards meaningful democracy. And that is a very serious threat. And it's easy to see why. There are many studies of Arab public opinion by leading US uh, uh, polling agencies, scholarly studies by polling agencies, and they give pretty much the same results. Uh, they, the United States surely does not want policies in the Arab countries, in Egypt and elsewhere, which will reflect public opinion. That is, policies which will perceive uh, Israel and the United States as the major threats, uh, won't perceive Iran as much of a threat, and we're considerable numbers, sometimes large majorities, I think the region would be more secure if Iran had nuclear weapons to offset U.S. power. Obviously, that's not what the U.S. and its allies uh, want to be Egyptian policy or policy of other countries. Uh, so therefore, the democracy has got to be stopped. Uh, democracy means, if it means anything, it means that public opinion is reflected in policy. Uh, well, uh, for, the, uh, for the West, the most important states are the dictatorships, of course, the oil dictatorships, and they've been okay. Their uh, democratic uh, 
uprisings have taken place, but they were ruthlessly crushed uh, with Western support and tolerance. So they're in good shape. Uh, elsewhere, the the more, uh, uh, the more the the major structures of the former dictatorships, including Egypt, have remained substantially intact, though they're threatened by popular forces. I don't have to tell you about that, which is a very serious concern in the West. That's why Obama and his allies uh, strongly supported the dictators in 2011, uh, France and Tunisia, Obama and Hillary Clinton in, the United, in Egypt, uh, did uh, as long as it was possible, till it was totally impossible to support them anymore. The army had turned against them, then try to reconstruct the former system. Well, fear of democracy is uh, demonstrated very dramatically uh, over and over, but it doesn't interfere with the uh, impressive rhetoric about uh, what's sometimes called our yearning for democracy. Actually, there can't be an example more clear than right on the borders of Egypt. Uh, the 2006 election in Palestine it was the first real free election in the Arab world. It was declared free and fair by independent observers. Uh, the U.S. and Israel did try hard to interfere with it, to uh, swing it to their favored candidates, but it didn't work. The election came out the wrong way. Uh, instantly, within days, uh, the U.S. and Israel, followed obediently by the European Union, uh, turned to uh, punishing the population for violating democracy by voting in the way they chose, not the way we chose. That's not democracy. Uh, the U.S. Uh, <laughs> uh, the U.S. then turned immediately to the routine procedure for overthrowing a democratic government where the people don't understand how to vote, uh, began planning for a military coup uh, to be led by Mahmoud Dahlan. Uh, the elected government preempted the coup in 2007, beat it back. Uh, that's an even worse crime. It's bad enough to vote the wrong way in a free election. It's even worse to deter a U.S. planned military coup to restore the government that was voted down. And the reaction was to escalate the punishment of the population uh, even more sharply with consequence that, consequences that you know about. I won't run through them. And that continues to the present. Uh, this demonstrates with remarkable clarity uh, the Western attitudes towards democracy. It's fine when it comes out the way we say, period. It's kind of interesting that this cannot be perceived. It's incidentally by no means the only example. Actually, that conclusion has been demonstrated by the most respected and quite conservative U.S. scholarship. I could give you the details if you're interested. It's found that to the present, the United States supports democracy if and only if it accords with strategic and economic interests. That's not very surprising, uh, nor is it surprising that the very well-established conclusions uh, are ignored and uh, don't interfere at all with the favorite doctrinal dogmas about our yearning for democracy and so on. Uh, of course, none of this is unique to the United States. Well, a control of the Middle East remains largely intact for the moment. Nevertheless, American it, it's threatened. That's up to you. Uh, American decline nevertheless continues in other dimensions. And quite significantly, the decline is in significant part uh, self-inflicted. 
And there's a recent study by the Economic Policy Institute in Washington that's the major source of uh, reliable, regular information and analysis of the economy, a lot of data on the economy. Now, the recent study of theirs is called Failure by Design. It reviews the data on the impact of the neoliberal policies of the past generation, which are very familiar to you, They're the same as those elsewhere, including Egypt, that includes uh, a remarkable concentration of wealth while wages have stagnated or declined. Uh, working hours have increased uh, well beyond Europe, and the weak benefit system has eroded standard features of neoliberal policies, sometimes called structural adjustment. Uh, the authors point out that the failure that they talk about is class-based. Uh, the designers have done wonderfully. They have achieved spectacular success, again, familiar. And they also stress that it's by design. Alternative policies always were possible, still are. And again, I point out that all of this should be entirely familiar to all of you right here. Uh, corporate power, which is now mostly financial capital, has become so influential in the political system uh, that by now both parties are well to the right of the population on major issues. That's why issues are largely excluded from the presidential campaigns, as you may have noticed if you've been following it. Uh, there are careful studies by mainstream political scientists which make it clear that in the collapsing political system, the very rich generally gain what they want, uh, while the, the general public, uh, that's independent of what the public may prefer. Uh, actually, the most detailed study by political scientist uh, Martin Gillens just appeared, it shows that uh, for about 70% uh, of the population are powerless to shape government policy. That means they're effectively disenfranchised. Uh, and, the and then as you move up the wealth level, you get a little more influence. When you get to the very top, you get what you want. Uh, the mechanisms are pretty clear. Uh, it's, it's important to point out, however, that by comparison with Europe, the United States is somewhat progressive in this respect. The, central bank in the United States, the Federal Reserve, it's heavily influenced by, its, by financial corporations, but it's pretty progressive in comparison with its European counterpart, the uh, European Central Bank, the ECB. The U.S. Fed is committed by law to two policies, two tasks. The first is uh, reducing unemployment and the second is to keep inflation from exploding. Now that concern is non-existent, uh, but the former one, maintaining employment, receives at least some attention by the Fed. Uh, in contrast, the ECB uh, uh, speak, has only one commitment, uh, keep inflation down uh, for the benefit of bankers, primarily the Bundesbank. Now that provides a very welcome opportunity, which is now being exploited in Europe, to end, uh, to dismantle the welfare state, and one of Europe's great contributions to modern civilization. And that's understood. That's what we're seeing before our eyes. Uh, the president of the ECB, Mario Draghi, it knew exactly what he was talking about when he informed the Wall Street Journal a few months ago that the continent's traditional social contract is obsolete, uh, not for any intrinsic reasons, but by design. Well, the self-inflicted blows in the United States, as in much of the West, are not a recent phenomenon. They go back 
to the 1970s when the political economy uh, underwent major transformations. The process expanded rapidly under Reagan and Thatcher. It's one component of the general and neoliberal assault on the populations of much of the world. Egypt didn't escape, uh, had severe uh, impact everywhere, pretty much everywhere, and pretty much the same structure. Well, there's no time here to run through the process to different forms and different societies, but with a great many structural similarities. Uh, the outcome is pretty clear, and sometimes it's clearly described. It's very well described in a brochure for investors that was put out a couple of years ago by Citigroup, one of the huge banking conglomerates. It's once again being rescued by the U.S. taxpayer, as it has been regularly since the Reagan years. Uh, that's uh, a cycle of risky loans, uh, huge profits, uh, bailout by the taxpayer. The head of the British, one of the heads of the British banking system calls this a doom cycle uh, that we're committed to, deeply committed to. Uh, the uh, bank's analysts describe a world that's divided into two blocks. Uh, one of them they call the plutonomy, the very rich. The second block is everyone else. Uh, they are sometimes called the global precariat, those who live a precarious existence, uh, whether or not they're lucky enough to have a job. Uh, in the United States, they're subjected to what's called growing worker insecurity. That's the basis for a healthy economy. Fed, Fed Chairman Alan Greenspan uh, testified to Congress while he was lauding his great uh, performance in economic management. That's the real shift in global society. It's not to China and India, it's to the global plutonomy, mostly centered in the United States, Britain, other rich societies, but with pieces of it everywhere. You can see them right here, the same in sub-Saharan Africa, everywhere else. There's a slice that's part of the plutonomy. The rest are the precariat. Uh, the Citigroup, this is an investment brochure, so they advise investors to focus on the very rich. That's where the action is. Uh, they have what they call a plutonomy stock basket, investments and in things that the rich need, you know, elegant jewelry and things like that. And they point out that the Plutonomy stock index has greatly outperformed uh, the world index of developed markets since 1985. That's when the Reagan-Thatcher uh, economic programs of enriching the very wealthy and punishing the rest uh, were really taking off in the rich countries, but of course much more, with much greater harm in the poorer countries. Well, before the 2007 crash, for which incidentally they were largely responsible, the financial institutions of the neoliberal failure by design era had gained startling economic power. They had more than tripled their share of corporate profits. It was up to 40% of total corporate profits in the United States. After the crash, finally, a number of economists began to inquire into their function in just purely economic terms, something that had rarely been done before, which is quite interesting. One of them was a Nobel laureate in economics, his colleague of mine, Robert Solo. Uh, he concluded that the general impact of the financial corporations is probably negative, quote him, the successes probably add little or nothing to the efficiency of the real economy, while the disasters, which are periodic and growing, uh, transfer wealth from taxpayers to financiers. Uh, the most respected financial correspondent in the English-speaking world is surely uh, Martin Wolf of the London Financial Times, he took a much stronger stance, I'll quote him. Uh, 
the out-of-control financial center sector is eating out the mo mo modern market economy from inside, just as the larva of a spider wasp eats out the host in which it has been laid. But it's a great success for the fraction of 1% of the population who are the designers of the current system and, not surprisingly, its beneficiaries. Well, by shredding the remnants of political democracy, they also carry, lay the basis for carrying the lethal process forward. Uh, and they will continue to do so as long as their victims are willing to suffer in silence and do not follow the inspiring model for which Tahrir Square has become a global symbol.